Okay. Um, good morning, people in Toronto. Good afternoon, people here in Bonn. Welcome um, to this um, twin conference on homotopy theory and applications to arithmetic and geometry, uh, which uh, obviously has started for people here and is uh, about to start in Toronto. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, with the program that we have here and very much look forward to uh, listening to all the talks. Um, but um, however joyful this occasion might be, uh, I want to also say um, one word about something of a somewhat more um, somber note, uh, namely uh, global warming, which is um, the reason why we have um, arranged for a conference in this particular format uh, in the first place. Uh, so for those who haven't um, paid attention to the news, um, our world now sees regular huge wildfires that run completely out of control for months that destroy cities to the ground in various places. Um, and choke millions with their smoke. Um, Joshua trees in California are dying. The great baobabs in Africa are dying. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia, the whole thing is dying. Um, uh, water in places is so warm that it doesn't have enough oxygen for fish to breathe. Um, all around the world, um, cities around the coast are racing for floods and destruction. Um, and, uh, and think about that, this is, this is not yet climate change. We're only at 1.2 degrees above what it was 100 years ago. Um, we're heading for easily twice that amount in our lifetimes. Um, God knows how much more in the lifetime of our children. Um, so, um, the reason I'm telling you that is that I want you to connect the dots. I want you to think about the fact that in this story, actually, we are the bad people. We are the bad people because we travel a lot. Our lifestyle is such that we go to conferences many times per year across the ocean many times per year. This is a thing that is commonly done in our, in our community, which is in direct connection with climate change. If you think about it, if you scale it like from like your individual contribution, like is, is more, assume you're someone who travels a lot, is more than that of someone else. Um, so the reason I'm telling you that is that uh, for people who go to conferences, just choose wisely where you go. Don't fly across the ocean to go to conferences. Choose ones that are close by. And for people who organize conferences, design your events in such a way that it allows for people around the world to come to them without having to fly huge distances. And I want to advertise a couple of initiatives that uh, are very encouraging. And I want to help advertise uh, overall, has recently teamed up with the Matrix, which is a science center in Australia, and they organize, they, they run its own, uh, their standard offering, what they call tandem workshops, and uh, it's essentially the same type of format with two audiences that are connected by video links. Um, and also ICMS, a conference center in Edinburgh, is uh, very much thinking about that. They have their my understanding is that in the near future, they will be running similar programs. Um, and uh, so I think that's great. And I think people should be aware of that and should take these opportunities and this should be advertised further. So um, so, I, so that's very encouraging. Um, yeah, so I want to now maybe just finish with one, uh, just practically little announcement. Um, uh, we we had announced uh, there's going to be some gather town moments at the end of the three um, the sequence of three plenary uh, talks uh, today. Um, 
so this is a great opportunity for people to uh, meet with uh, with the speakers that are from the other side. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, Peter will not be able to join today because of uh, family commitments. Um, that being said, I uh, hand the microphone to uh, Lucas Bratner, who's going to introduce our first speaker. So uh, we now have Peter Scholz speaking on analytic geometry. Oh, thanks. <laughs> ah, what happens? <laughs> no, I think so. I, you can mute that. Okay. Uh, oops, now I'm all blurry. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm always happy to be here. Um, right, so I want to talk about uh, analytic geometry. Um, so I guess as we're supposed to refer to this kind of long project that I have with Dustin Clausen. Um, and I always kind of choose at random the whole part of this uh, uh, that I will present. And uh, anyways, so I mean, so the, the kind of goal that we have here <clears throat> is to uh, generalize some of the methods of algebraic geometry so from particular at this conference somewhere we've seen that there are lots of higher categorical techniques that now now in place in algebraic geometry that you really look at i don't know the, the derived infinity category of modules on this or something like that um such things that you do in algebraic geometry uh to the setting of various kinds of analytic geometries you might think about analytic, I think complex analytic, they might be real analytic. There are also these periodic rigid analytic things. Um, uh, in geometry. Um, and in the process somehow maybe also like usually when you do complex analytic geometry or something like this, you usually talk about varieties of some kind of fixed space field. And it's usually quite important that it's really varieties. So usually it's important to have some kind of finite type situation when you do analytic geometry. Um, but I mean, for schemes, schemes, they work over any phase. They, I don't know, you don't need any Neusserian assumptions and so on. And we also want to generalize some, uh, um, have some analytic geometry where you don't a priori need some base field to, that you work over and where you don't need any kind of finite type assumptions and so on. And so all this all goes hand in hand. Um, right. What did I want to say next? Um, but and it's kind of hard to, like, also because maybe we're not settled on what an analytic space actually is in our setting. Um, uh, let me instead do something else and prove a prove a very basic theorem in complex geometry, like. Like maybe the most basic result in like the series of complex functions on, of one variable. Okay. So here's something extremely basic. Yeah, so today, explain a new proof. Something extremely basic. Uh, so this is the following theorem, which I don't know, it's maybe known for 400 years or something like this. Uh, so there's a about, about the notion of, of holomorphic functions of one variable, right? So, uh, and one way to say that this is the variable here series, some of that there is a unique sheaf O uh, of C algebras on the topological space C. I mean, this maps any open subset U of the complex numbers to the from a holomorphic functions on U. And so this should have two properties. First of all, it should be some other sheaf. And when you evaluate on a disk, you should be able to say what it is. So such that for U, 
being the disk of some radius around some point. So these are all the complex numbers of distance at most r uh, around some point. Um, then holomorphic functions on this u, they should really be given by globally convergent power series. So they should be given by power series. And times t minus x to the n. Um, where the ans are some coefficients. And uh, they should have the property that it's somehow globally convergent on the whole disk. So in other words, well, if you want the distance of some of some radius less than r, and then an times r prime to the n let's go to zero. Okay, so this would be the value on on some disk. Uh, and of course, I want the transition maps to be the obvious ones. So if you have such a power series that converges on some disk, it converges on any more disk con contained in there. And then, because any open subset can be covered by such disks, and it's a sheaf, you can somehow then determine what the value on any U must be. But in some sense, you've overdetermined the sheaf because you can also then cover this disk by smaller disks. And upper or you could then define an element of O of U if you just have some function that's somehow locally given by a power series expansion. Um, and then the claim is somewhat, what is actually being claimed here? What's the non trivial in, uh, statement? The non trivial statement is that if you have a function on a disk, a function to the complex numbers that is locally around each point given by a convergent power series expansion, then actually it's there's one power series expansion that works on the whole disk. And this is actually not so trivial, really. Yeah? I mean, so this is, and let me include one further statement to make it even slightly more non trivial. And if you compute the, the cohomology of this thing on any disk, then this is also zero. I think it's zero. All right. So the first part was surely known to Cauchy. The second part was definitely known to Cousin and probably before that. Um, so how does this usually proved? The usual proof uh, is to use Cauchy integrals. So you integrate this function along some uh, some circles around the origin uh, to compute, to estimate the coefficients. Thank you. <clears throat> so if you have such a function that's only locally a priori given by such a power series expansion, you can still develop it at the center of the disk. You get some coefficients a n, and then you need to show that they aren't they aren't too big, and this you do using these Cauchy integrals. Uh, and the usual proof would be to use some del bar methods for the code to compute cohomology. So there's some kind of analysis involved. Uh, and so, so as part of this course, I've just finished with Dustin Clausen. So Dustin Clausen and I, we were giving a joint course called Condensed Mathematics and Complex Geometry, where we've uh, somehow rebuilt, like, yeah, some of the, fun, the basic stuff in complex geometry using the perspective I will explain today. And like, we just finished last week by proving hertz wolf riemann roch for complex manifolds using uh, these methods. Okay. So yeah, so it's a new argument. Ah, oh, by the way, people told me that already Weierstrass was looking for a different way to prove this because he didn't like the, the appearance of integrals in proving that. And I don't like it either because <clears throat> the theorem has a periodic version. And the, the periodic version there, you really directly look at these algebras of power series and they somehow see that they form a sheaf. Um, and it doesn't really make sense to to do to use integrals in the periodic world. So there's there there is no analog of of the usual proof over the periodic numbers. So the, some of the proofs of the periodic and the complex numbers they are incompatible, and we would somehow like to have one compatible formalism. So also for this reason, we need some kind of new argument for this. 
Okay, and uh, so in the spirit of this conference, maybe uh, the new argument really abstracts the result even further. And instead of looking for the sheaf of rings, you look for a sheaf of infinity categories. I mean, a priori, you would just like to localize the algebra of like entire functions on C, on C. And by localize, I always mean to turn it into the global sections of a sheaf. Um, what we will instead do is not just localize this one algebra, but really localize all modules over it, uh, over, over on this topological space. Instead, localize the whole, and the end of it should be some of the infinity, infinity derived category. Uh, oh, well, what we want to do is something look at something at like topological modules over. Over this one. And so this is somehow related to spectral theory. Um, Uh, so if you say you would just have something like a Banach space uh, over C, and it comes with some endomorphism T, uh, then this is actually automatically a module over the entire functions. And so you, you have the spectrum of this T acting on V, which is some closed subset. Um, Oh, yeah. So the locus where this is supported. And so some of the idea is that from this category of modules, we will have some kind of abstract theory of, of its spectrum and an abstract theory of some of where modules are supported. And so you get upper, on upper or some very abstract topological space or maybe even locale, you will get some localization of the category. And then in the second step, you show that actually this a priori very abstract locale is actually at least mapping to, to just the topological space C, so that in particular you can localize on the complex numbers. So, yeah, let me. See that here. So, so there's three steps. Uh, so one is to define uh, the right category. The second is to um, define this abstract notion of uh, spectrum and support. And the three to make any of this abstract nonsense concrete is to show that this spectrum maps to C. <clears throat> then, yeah, some of, but the abstract series, some of, this category, it will localize on this abstract spectrum, but because this maps to C in particular, it will localize over the complex numbers. And then once you have that on all modules, you can, can in particular use it for the like, unit object in this category. And then you get that sheaf. And this, by a very simple computation, you can evaluate it on a disk. And then you see that you, you get the desired sheaf. All right, 
So there are three steps to do. So let's start with the first one. Um, and so you want to consider some kind of topological modules and maybe even some kind of complete locally convex ones or something like this because you want to do some kind of analysis, some kind of functional analysis. Um, we want something like complete locally convex topological all vector spaces I mean, plus, plus a module action yeah. but let's forget about the module structure and just work worry about uh, which kind of like topological R vector spaces that we want to consider and, and the problem is that this is not a nice category from the categorical perspective so I mean usually when you have a category of modules you would expect that to be an abelian category but this is not at all abelian Um, so, for example, you might there's something that also comes up in practice. I mean, you might, I don't know, say you have an L1 Banach space of sequences, and this sits densely in like the space of L2 sequences. And so the, the quotient is very bad. I mean, if you just take it in topological vector spaces, it would be. In this have the indiscrete topology, so there is no interesting topology left. Uh, if you then somehow force it to be complete again, you just get zero. And so this would be something whose kernel is zero and whose co-kernel is zero in this category, but it's obviously not an isomorphism. Um so I know so my, you must work in a setting where it's some sensible thing to take quotients of such such vector spaces. And so uh, this is where uh, this condensed mathematics enters the solution is to replace at least on the side of like on the module like on the, uh, on the side where we really do the algebra we should replace all the topological spaces by condensed sets. So let me briefly recall the story. So uh, condensed set is a sheaf on uh, the category of pro finite sets. So this is really just the pro category of the finite category of finite sets. Um, you can also consider these as a stone spaces, so the totally disconnected compact also spaces, or yet differently, you consider consider this as Boolean algebras up by stone duality. Um, uh, with respect to like, let me just say it here. Here it's called the FTQC topology. Here it's a effective epimorphism topology. So it's a Grotendieck topology on this uh, category. And uh, I should make a warning sign about uh, this is large, large category. Um, so you need to do something about this. And there are actually two ways to resolve this. And one is uh, called the pycnotic thing where you fix some different universes. This was developed by Clark Warwick and Peter Hain. And there is a way to do this without choosing universes. And that's what we call condensed. But Never mind this difference, it plays no role in oh, what we're doing. <clears throat> uh, 
So the claim is that there is something like a topological space, and uh, basically what happens here is that uh, like we, we we somewhat take some kind of building blocks for all topological spaces, which we take to be these stone spaces, and then somehow everything is now declared to be from in some sense freely generated under co-limits by stone spaces, with the only relations coming from like what we declare to be covers. Um, and uh, more concretely, one way to think about this is that if T is a topological space. And maybe I assume its points are close, so this means it's T1. Um, then you can define a condensed set T underline, which takes any profile at set S and maps it to the continuous functions. You can say it as a stone space from T to S, it's a condensed set. So, in other words, when you pass from topological spaces to condensed sets, what happens is that you're just remembering how, how stone spaces map into your topological space. So in particular, what the convergent sequences are, uh, because convergent sequences are exactly like maps from the one point compactification of the integers to, to T. And uh, this functor turns out to be close to fully faithful. So in particular, like so Paul just say like the compactly generated weekly Hausdorff guys. This actually embeds fully faithfully into the so-called quasi-separated condensed sets. So quasi-separated is an adjective <coughs> that comes. I mean, whenever you have sheaves on any side, there's a notion of a quasi-separated object, and some of the analog of being Hausdorff. So the, the house of objects on the side of condensed sets, they are basically equivalent to this category of complex generated weak house stuff. So it's quite close to an equivalence. Um, but then, then you have the non house of objects and they are like really manifestly new objects like these funny quotients of an L2 sequences by L1 sequences. Um, yeah, I mean, also if you somehow consider quasi compact and quasi separated condensed sets. So, somehow quasi compact is the analog of being compact, quasi separated is the analog of being Hausdorff. So, you would expect these to be something like compact Hausdorff spaces, and actually, that's exactly what they are. <clears throat> so, yeah, so basically, all your familiar topological spaces they are still there when you pass through condensed sets, but you get some new ones which are some kind of Kind of funny quotient objects uh, that weren't so sensible as topological spaces, but are completely sensible as condensed sets. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and in particular, there's this proposition like, I don't know, uh, if you consider condensed to be in groups, so which are, you can either think of as sheaves of being groups on this, or as a being group objects in condensed sets. Um, this is actually in a being category now. And it's, it's, it's a very nice one. So filtered columns are exact, infinite products are exact. It has compact projective generators and so on. Let me just say that. So it's basically a growth nickel being category up to, up to size issues. So there's some kind of free condensed being groups on S where S is extremely disconnected. And similarly, you can also consider condensed R vector spaces. And I guess maybe at this point I should still underline this. So you have the usual topological ring of the real numbers we will now always consider it as a condensed ring. And so let me drop it from now on. Um, and then you can like for over any condensed ring, it makes sense to consider the condensed modules. Um, 
And uh, I mean, this has all the same properties as well. And let me just give you a formula for what this free guy is in this case. So let's think of this stone spaces or whatever the, really as pro-finite sets. You write them as, a, as an inverse limit of finite sets SI. And then one way to think about this is that it's a union over all cutoff constant C over the limit over all I of the part of the free R vector space on the SI where the L0 norm is at most C. And so the yeah, zero norm is basically measuring the number of non-zero coefficients, except that you might also slightly take into account how large the coefficients are. So the L0 norm, if you have a sequence x1 through xn and take its L0 norm, then I define this right now to be the sum of all i of, you take the absolute values of the xi, but then you take the integer above that. So particularly if this is at most c, then they're at most c of these that are non-zero. So these are actually kind of, yeah. The elements of this are just, Finite sums with real coefficients of elements of S. <clears throat> but this is really telling you the structure as a condensed set. So, I mean, when you have this finite dimensional vector space, and this is a bounded subset, so this is a compact Hausdorff space. So, the inverse limit is still compact Hausdorff. And then this is this increasing union of compact Hausdorff spaces. So, if you wanted some kind of compact generated weak Hausdorff thing. All right. Um, Okay, so the, the, some of the picture is that now yeah, that we have this notion of condensed real vector spaces, and we have a functor from topological R vector spaces, uh, V has to be underlined, um, where this functor here is somewhat close to being a fully faceful functor. And in practice, like on Banach or Fréchet or whatever spaces, it really is a fully faceful functor. Um, and here, some of, people have isolated this nice subcategory of complete locally convex. Uh, topological R vector spaces. And I mean, we, we, we do want an analog of this category because we want, like, if you take tensor products of vector spaces, we don't just want an abstract algebraic tensor product of these vector spaces, but we want to complete it tensor product where we get new, get new convergent sequences somehow. Uh, so we need a notion of completeness on the side of uh, condensed real vector spaces. But it must be slightly subtle because we want in a being category, right? And up there, I was giving you those examples of these L1 and L2 spaces in the dense embedding. And we definitely want Banach spaces like L1 and L2. We want these to be, uh, to be complete. And so we also want the quotient of these things to be complete. But this quotient, this is funny, non-separated quotient, I mean, non-housed of quotient. So it must be slightly subtle how you really phrase this condition here. It turns it out, you can. Um, And so there is this notion of, and for this, I, for some funny reason, need to fix an extra parameter P that lies between zero and one. Um, you have the so-called P liquid. I'll make this one. <clears throat> and one way to say what these are is that it's a subcategory generated by something I call less than P. Well, let me write it in the following funny form to make the analogy slightly closer. Um, so some kind of free guy on S, but now we in some sense replace the L0 norm there by the less than P norm, meaning that, well, we first of all take a union over all Q less than P, and then again, a union over all constants of the limit of the part of the free 
vector space on the finite set as i. So this is again just some finite free r vector space, and then we take some bounded region, which is a region where the LQ norm is at most c. Where I guess I should say what the LQ norm is. Uh, so you take the sum of the xi's to the q, and you may or may not take the q's root in the end. Doesn't really matter. <clears throat> Um, so we would have liked to do this, not for some funny choice of P, but for P equal to one and actually not with this lesson, but really, really just do this thing with an L1 norm here. But then it turns out that this subcategory wouldn't be in the B in category uh, with its right property. So um, turns out that you're really forced to include non-locally convex vector spaces uh, into this picture here. And so somewhat, really pass to the setting of L P norms and P is less than one uh, when you define this. Okay. And then and there's also a notion of P convex topological vector space on the other side. So these would actually always be part of this category, but. Oops. Yeah, so the theorem, uh, which is really quite hard. Uh, is that, I mean, okay, so this is what we call uh, Lick P. Is in the VN subcategory, so it's stable on the uh, kernels and co-kernels. In fact, it's stable under all limits and co-limits. And also extensions, um, and what I want the free guys to be—they are actually compact projective objects. And so, in particular, again, filtered colimits are exact, and this would be in category infinite products are exact. So it's a really nice setting to do homological algebra in. All right, and but this also means that, like, if you have such a p liquid vector space, then some uh, this automatically means you can take certain kind of convergent sums automatically because whenever you have like some compact, like like some profinite set S mapping into your liquid vector space, and actually always this free guy will map into there, and this somehow includes certain infinite sums of elements of of, of S, so. So in some in the setting that we're working in, some uh, um, whether you can take a limit, or the limits you take, they are some uh, the limits you can take in V. They are not extra data, but they are some uh, part of the structure. They are they automatically exist and are unique and so on. Even though uh, sometimes we work with highly non non Hausdorff uh, vector spaces, so still they somehow know about which limits exist and how to compute them. All right, and so uh, in particular, we can take uh, the category that we want to consider are the modules over C adjoint T, so a polynomial algebra in the right category of liquid P module. So this is, what is it? So this is a co-complete low symmetric monoidal. It's actually also compactly generated. So 
Okay, so these are so this is some kind of yeah, variation of like a complete locally convex vector space, and then we take such with an endomorphism. <clears throat> and yeah, everything is now actually over, over C. Yeah, so this is this will be the category that we looked for in, in like part one of our strategy, which is still up there for the people in the room. All right. <clears throat> uh, I should say that, like, there is this funny choice of P here, and we don't really know what it means, but we, we just fix one, okay. And some, I mean, like, like when we gave that course, the choice of P never mattered in any way. So now it just it was just a parameter that was there, but played no role. Um, but note that, like when when P gets closer to one, these categories become smaller and smaller. So in some sense, the most general theorem is when you take P very small. But the thing that's closest to like usual function analysis, so closest to usual convexity, is when P is equal to one. Um, okay. So the second is about this uh, spectrum. And uh, I mean, some of the idea that uh, to develop some kind of abstract theory of supports along the lines that I will present here in the in the case of functional analysis, there's a paper of uh, uh, Taylor from '72 that already sketches out some some ideas of this fashion. Um, in the more specific kind of setting that we're working in here of these kind of fancy stable infinity carries and so on. Uh, I mean, this is very much like the work that's now known as the Balmer spectrum and so on. Although we will not quite, I think, use the thing that's usually known as the Balmer spectrum. But there, there's a paper, for example, Balmer and Favi and uh, others, um, which I think is from 2000, I mean, some, some, sometime in the 2010s, um, um, developed some such notions of, of, of a spectrum. Uh, so let me just say what it is that we're doing. Um, so C is any uh, co -com like co complete closed symmetric model. Stable infinity category. I could probably get by just having its homotopy category, so just a triangulated category, but um, let me actually use the infinity category. <coughs> Uh, and so we want to associate to this it will, will probably in general not really be a topological space, just a locale, uh, which we note by S of C. Um, and the idea is the following. So such that the closed subsets Z in this locale. Uh, correspond uh, more or less by definition to the idempotent algebras A and T. So idempotent just means that A, if you form A tensor A, and of course A maps to this, this would be an asymptote. Okay, and turns out that. <clears throat> The a priori, like idempotent algebras, they for, would form an infinity category, but actually, you can show that between any two idempotent algebras, there's at most one map. And so, this the idempotent algebras naturally actually form a partially ordered set, and this should be the partially ordered set of closed subsets of this, that locale. Okay. Um, how should I do this?
I started a little late, so I still have a few minutes left, but I should still uh, hurry up. So in this setting, I mean, whenever you have such, a, such an unimportant algebra, you can define a category somehow that corresponds to the closed subset to be the modules over A and C. And because A is unimportant, actually being a module over A is not a datum, it's just a condition. So there's actually naturally a full subcategory of here where I denote this function here to by I lower star. And then it actually turns out that it has a left adjoint I upper shriek, uh, I upper star and a right adjoint I upper shriek. The I upper star of the module M is just M tensor A. And I upper shriek is internal home from A into M. And you can also define a category corresponding somewhat to the complementary open to be the Verdier quotient of C by C of Z, which is so some symmetric monoidal, blah, blah, blah. Um, and of course, there is a functor from C into there, which is I don't know by J upper star. And again, this has a left adjoint J upper J lower shriek and a right adjoint J upper star. Um, and instead of writing formulas for them, let me just say that there are triangles for any M, so M maps to I lower star, I upper star M, and the fiber of this is J lower strict J upper star. And we also have such a sequence. So some of the usual sequences you would expect uh, for such functors to be satisfied, they are satisfied. So it's, yeah, it works exactly as it's supposed to. And some really simple proposition is that some uh, in the setting, U mappings to C of U is a sheaf of blah, 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 infinity categories. Close symmetric monoidal, whatever. <clears throat> and there's really not much to prove here in a sense. Uh, but it's really critical that you work in a stable setting. So if you try to do thing, the same thing on the levels of being categories, it would not really work. Um, so one thing is that when you form an intersection, then this corresponds to taking the tensor product of the algebras. But when you take a union, this corresponds to like the disjoint union, which would be A times A prime, but they, these functions should agree on the intersection, which is A tensor A prime, corresponds to A tensor A prime. <clears throat> And in the, on the BN level, this equalizer would reduce to the kernel, but there's somehow no reason the kernel of this map is still an unimportant algebra. But if you somehow work in the stable setting and really consider some of this complex, and this turns out to be unimportant itself again. So if you really want the abstract formalism to work, you really have to work at least in the triangulated setting. All right. He worked without enhancement, but I mean, he was also upper right concerning something slightly different, like the sick tensor ideals or something like this is probably what's usually, I think, referred to as a Balmer spectrum. But I mean, there, there are some variations on a theme here, and this is one of the variations, let's say that. Uh, I mean, one thing that's very important here is that, I mean, often, I mean, all categories are actually compactly generated, but uh, in, I mean, if you look at, I don't know, a perfect complex or something like this, and usually it's the case that if you're compactly generated, you actually generate it by the unit. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, and the unit is compact. So for us, also the unit is, is a compact object. So then you, usually it's the case that then the unit generates everything. But this is very much not the case for us. We have many, many more compact objects because you have all these free vector spaces on like large profinite sets. Um, and so this is like maybe the main difference between the setting we're working in and where we're some are doing more analysis because this come out comes from the extra compact objects that we have. Uh, and like the more algebraic setting that's usually considered. Um, 
All right. And so, okay, so let me wrap up by uh, briefly talking about the third step. So now we, we have we have this funny locale of this huge category. Of like P liquid C adjoint T modules. And so by the way, this is also the derived infinity category of some B in category. You could uh, move some symbols around. Um, uh, and we want to map basically this, we want to map to the complex numbers. And so how do we do that? Well, the closed subsets in here, they correspond to idempotent algebra. So we must find some idempotent algebras, but there are some that you can just write down, namely by looking at these algebras of polymorphic functions on disks. So we can for, um, we can define an idempotent algebra for the locus where we want the closed subsets. So let's look at the locus where T is at most one. And so then, these we define somewhat to be the, the, the holomorphic functions that converge on the disk, but actually they converge on slightly beyond the disk. Uh, it's a better choice. So if we take the unit of all the radii greater than one of those power series, uh, some an times t to the n, where an times r to the n goes to zero. Uh, this is item potent. by a rather simple computation. But here we really, in order for this to be idempotent, it's critical that we work with some kind of complete topological vector space because otherwise the self center product would just be the algebraic one. And algebraically, this is definitely not an idempotent algebra over Z20. <clears throat> and uh, more generally, uh, for all F and C adjoint T and R bigger than zero, You can somehow define abstractly the locus where the absolute value of f is less or equal to r and the locus where f is greater or equal to the r. By writing down, well, it's actually enough to do this in the universal, in the universal case where it's just t itself, and then you just write down some algebras. <clears throat> okay. So you have some examples of idempotent algebras that are well, easy to see. But then the question is, how do these different idempotent algebras actually interact? So what happens if you form tensor products and so on? And I mean, this gets quite tricky, right? Because I mean, already if you take a tensor product for two disks, you somewhat expect that this tensor product should be the polymorphic functions on the intersections of those two disks, but the intersection is not at all a disk itself. And it's quite hard to explicitly write down what holomorphic functions there are. So, um, so explicitly, explicitly under, understanding what these tensor products do, it's kind of tricky. Uh, and thus, uh, and somehow more or less equivalent to proving the theorem we actually cared about in the beginning. So, um, so what's the trick? So, uh, what you can actually easily show is that you get a map as follows. So you have the locus where the absolute value of t is finite, which is a subset of this funny locale of, of, of that category there, which is a, come on, an open subset if you want of this locale. <clears throat> and this maps naturally to something called the Berkowitz spectrum of C adjoint T. So these are all the, the, the absolute value of kind of functions from C of G are greater or equal to zero, uh, satisfying some obvious things like the absolute value of zeros if we restrict the absolute value of A is the usual absolute value of A, A and C. And it should be multiplicative. And it should be satisfy the triangle inequality. <clears throat> I mean, so that, I mean, here it literally makes sense to look at the locus where some function F is less than or equal to R. Right? It's literally a subset there. Turns out the topology here is defined so that it is a closed subset. And so some of this pulls back to the corresponding subset here. Uh, <clears throat> and then one finishes by using a theorem that goes back to Ostrowski from 1916. 
um, that, well, one way to produce such an absolute value is to just evaluate this function at some complex number and then take the usual absolute value. And what Ostrovsky proved is that this is actually the only way. So, seems isomorphic into here. <clears throat> Why are yeah, taking any complex number to evaluate a polynomial there and take the absolute value? Uh, the proof is actually really simple. It's like a five line argument. So, it's, it's, it's nothing deep. It's just an uh, important fact. And actually, the only place here that we use that we really work with the complex numbers instead of the periodic numbers. So, for the periodic numbers, this work which spectrum would be much more complicated, but it's still the natural space that you should localize over. So, uh, you still got the right statement somehow. Right, and so once we have that, yeah, so then, well, this category, or rather this part where really the absolute value of t is finite, you know, localizes over the complex numbers, and so you get some of the structure sheep over here, and you easily compute that its value on this is what you want it to be. I'm already over time, so let me stop. <laughs>